I, for those who don't know me, I do want to say that I'm a, 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 a Rothbardian, a Mazesian, and proud to be an anarcho-capitalist. Um, I, I view the state as a criminal gang, and like Rothbard, I hate the state. Uh, it is good to be here in Texas, I, and I live here now, live in Houston, and uh, I'm from Louisiana, uh, but I, I'm glad that I moved here. And uh, uh, what, what I like most about Texas is I think we have the greatest chance of seceding from this empire that we're probably the most important part of, unfortunately. So I would like a governor who would push for that. But let me turn to my topic now. Uh, let me have a raise of hands. How many people here have read Human Action? Okay, okay, that's pretty good. So I'm gonna, in my talk, uh, I've, I've given a lot of speeches on intellectual property. Tonight will be a little bit different um, approach um, from some of the other ways I've, I've talked about in the past. So let me ask a general question. Why are you all here at this great government school? Is it to have fun, right? But it's also to learn, right? That's the basic purpose of education, is to learn. Of course, if you realize if I was speaking before LSU, my alma mater, I couldn't make that assumption. But I kid my home state. Thank God for Mississippi, we always say. <laughs> but we learn things all the time, right? Uh, a university is a more formalized way of learning, but learning is very important. This sounds like a trite observation, and we, we make these comments all the time. Education is important. Learning is good. But this leads me to the focus of my talk, which is about learning and the importance of information and knowledge and copying and emulation on the market and in life in general. So let's think about how learning is important and how it's used in everyday life. Ludwig von Mises, famous Austrian economist, the father of the modern Austrian movement, systematized the study of human action and gave it a name, praxeology. This is the, the study of the logic of human action. So what he does is he analyzes action in very simple elementary terms. He breaks it down. So I want you to think about it. If you haven't heard of praxeology, don't be daunted by the expression. The idea is to look at what the components of human action are, what we do every day all the time. Every time a human acts, what is he doing? He looks around the world. He chooses an end or a goal that he wants to achieve, some purpose of his, something he wants to happen, something that would not happen without his actor, active intervention in the world. So he chooses one action over the other, and he chooses his highest valued action or end by definition. Now, how does he achieve the goal that he's chosen? He has to select certain means. Means, this is what Mises calls means and, 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 and the Austrians. Things that are physically efficacious, things that let you causally interfere in the world to achieve what you want to achieve. So let's take an example. You're all eating now, so um, let's take a food example. Let's say you're hungry. So you decide, well, I know that I like cake. I know I like chocolate cake. I think, I'll, I think I'll try to acquire chocolate cake. Now, you can see right off the bat, knowledge has entered the picture, your knowledge of what you like. You've learned this from experience, maybe, but knowledge is already playing a role in your decisions and your action, right? So how do you do this? Well, one, one thing, you might obtain a recipe for cake and get the ingredients and the tools to make the cake. Mixing bowl, eggs, flour, spoon, kitchen, oven, spend some time, you make a cake. And you make that cake instead of watching television or getting your car washed or changing your clothes or making a vanilla cake. All right? So this illustrates that human action is the purposeful use of means, the use of means, to achieve a desired end or result. Okay? But notice that the means that you employ have to be physical or scarce resources things that are real things in the world, things that you can affect, like the mixing bowl in the oven. So this is what you employ to achieve your goal. And if you notice, uh, the Austrians, especially Mises, goes into the, st the logical structure of human action that we just discussed implies so many things. And for example, it implies opportunity cost. We already talked about how you choose this thing instead of the other things. These, the things that you didn't choose are the cost, the opportunity cost of your action. It presupposes causality. You have, to, you have to believe that there's a way to achieve your result by manipulating the world in accordance with causal laws. It also has the concept of profit and, pro, profit and loss built in, which is not only a monetary concept but a psychic concept. 
not psychic in the Shirley MacLaine sense, but psychic in the psyche sense. For example, if you achieve your end, which is a nice chocolate cake, and if it's as you envisioned it, and if you enjoyed it like you expected that you would, then you've achieved a profit, right? If it turns out to be a, a failure or you don't enjoy it for some reason, then there's a loss. Now, where does this leave the role of learning? Learning is important because it's how we acquire information. And information is important because it gives us knowledge of how the world is. Okay? So the more, that, the more knowledge you have, the wider is your universe of choices. You have more ends to choose from, for example. Let's say one person knows only of the possibility of making a vanilla cake or a chocolate cake. Well, if he learns of a coconut cake, this, this new idea, now he's choosing between three things. So his knowledge of the ends can expand and give him a, a wider array of choices. And importantly, you also have to have knowledge of means, causal laws of the world, okay? Uh, because this informs your choice of means. Once you choose what you want to achieve, you need to know how to achieve it. So you need to basically have what you can call a recipe. And this doesn't only mean for food. This is just a general way to do something by exploiting resources in the world to achieve what you want to achieve. So you know, for example, that if you take an egg and flour and some chocolate and mix them in a certain way and you bake it, then after a while you have something that's edible. So the role of knowledge in action is to guide action, to guide action. It's not the means of action. So for example, you might know of five different ways of getting the cake that you desire. One may be to steal the cake. It's unethical, but it's a possible way. One may be to bake the cake. One may be to purchase the cake. One may be to hire someone to bake the cake for you. Okay? So in other words, the more knowledge you have, the wider the universe of ends and means is that you have to draw on. So this is the reason why learning is good. Um, if you think about all the great creators in the past, Michelangelo, Bach, they drew upon knowledge that they acquired from the culture they were born into. Even the greatest inventors didn't think of everything on their own. Okay? So now let's think about the role of scarcity in the free market. Given this understanding of what human action is, this very simple structural view of human action, we use knowledge to guide our choices and the use of means to achieve certain ends. Okay, what's the role of external resources in the world? That's external objects, scarce things in the world. The role of these things is to be used by men to achieve their ends. But knowledge guides your actions. It helps you choose what you want to do. Okay? So now think about the purpose of the free market system. What is the purpose of it? Or what is its function? What is its result? It's to help us achieve abundance. Right? We live in a world of scarcity. We don't live in the Garden of Eden. We live in a world where survival is not, even, not easy. It's, it's difficult. We have to find ways to survive because there's scarcity. There's not bananas hanging from every tree enough for everyone to survive off of. But the free market operates to unleash human creative energy and to allow tremendous productivity. If you think about it, although we have scarcity and there's nothing we can do about this fundamental fact of the universe, the free market helps us in a way fight this or overcome this. Right? But the thing is, the only way you can do this is to have a free market. And a free market has to be built on private property principles. The reason we have to have private property is because these things are scarce. Economists call them rivalrous because you can have rivalry or fighting over these things. So for example, uh, for a productive use to be made of the spoon in, in, the, in the cake example. Someone has to own the spoon. Someone has to be the one person who has the right to control that spoon. Now, how do they know that? Because property rights set up objective borders that tell you who owns things. They're visible and observable. This doesn't mean that there's no crime. This doesn't mean that everyone respects the rights. There can be thieves. But, it, but at least with thieves, we could theoretically deal with them with crime prevention techniques. As, as Hans-Hermann Hoppe says, uh, thieves are just a technical problem. Um, but people that want to live in harmony and use these resources productively have to have a system of property rights to allocate the use of the spoon. Now, sometimes it's said that libertarians believe in property rights and all the other systems are not really strong believers in property rights. This is true in a sense if you mean property rights in a particular way. 
But if you mean property rights, you mean the right to control a scarce resource, which is what property is, its ownership, then every system on the face of the earth believes in property rights. Right? Every system on the earth will have a legal rule that says who's the owner of this platform, who's the owner of that factory, who's the owner of your paycheck. Right? For example, in the, in, the, in the modern welfare state, quasi-socialist state we live in today, uh, the, the ownership rule is that the government owns about half of my ch paycheck. So it's clear that there's property rights in it. It's just I only have about half and the government has the other half. So in every society, the legal system assigns an owner. Now what's unique about libertarianism is not that we believe in property rights. Everyone does. It's our particular property rights scheme, which is basically the spinning out of the Lockean idea that the person that owns a given contested resource is the first user of it or someone that he sold or gave the property to. Okay. So the purpose of property rights is to permit us to peacefully, productively, and cooperatively use these things that are unfortunately scarce that cannot be used by more than one person at a time. I don't know if all you've heard of the Misesian calculation argument, but in the 1920s, Ludwig von Mises uh, published a seminal paper which explained that why socialism cannot work, why economics is literally impossible under socialism, that is, full-fledged socialism. And the reason is because there is no way to compare competing projects unless you can do so in numerical terms. It's a very simple idea, but you can't compare building a bridge to planting an orchard. There's no way to, they're not comparable units. So Mises realized that in a free market system with money prices, everything resolves in terms of money. You can compare with money prices. And the problem is, in socialism, you don't have real money prices. You don't have real money prices because there's no private property in the means of production. So this is the basic insight of Mises as to exactly why a private property system permits the free market to be prosperous and to generate and to fight this condition of scarcity. Okay? So the market's producing more things all the time. Now, it doesn't ever eliminate scarcity, but it fights it. If, if we had the government off our backs, you could probably buy a Mercedes for $500. Right? You could buy a microwave oven for a, a penny. Um, so they wouldn't be infinitely providable, but they would be so plentiful everyone could have what they wanted. Now, what are the key elements of a free market economy that allows this to happen? Well, one is cooperation, right? The free market, by setting up property borders, allows people to cooperate instead of fighting over a resource. It also gives rise to competition. That is, people compete with each other. Um, my friend Jeff Tucker of Mises Institute has a, uh, he, he related to me a, a, a really good formulation of what competition is that was given to him by Larry Reed, who's now the president of FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. And Reed's formulation is that competition is the striving for excellence in the service of others. And that's true. That's what it is. You try to constantly improve what you're making to try to please the customer. So this gives rise to a relentless effort on the part of the market, people in the market, to lower cost to make things more efficiently, to serve customers as best you can because you're in competition. But we've left out one thing. Remember we talked about human action. A key aspect of human action is knowledge. You have to have knowledge to guide your actions. So how does this relate to the market? What's the role of knowledge in human action? It's emulation. On the market, you see someone successful and you emulate them. This is what, how competition arises. You see someone attracting customers, comes up with, let's say some guy invents a slushy stand, well, you, and he's getting a lot of customers. Well, you might build your own slushy stand to compete with him. You copied your idea from the, from the guy. So what? Customers are better off. Now the original guy might improve his slushy stand. He might offer more flavors. This relentless striving to please the customer benefits everyone. This is the process of the market, and it presupposes the idea of copying information, learning information, emulating, 